reading from Ezekiel chapter 39, verses 21 to 29. And I will set my glory among the nations, and all the nations shall see my judgment that I have executed, and my hand that I have laid on them. The house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. And the nations shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity, because they dealt so treacherously with me, that I hid my face from them and gave them into their hands of their adversaries, and they all fell by the sword. I dealt with them according to their uncleanness and their transgressions, and hid my face from them. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Now I will restore the fortunes of Jacob, and have mercy on the whole house of Israel, and I will be jealous for my holy name. They shall forget the shame and all the treachery that have practiced against me when they dwell securely and their land with none to make them afraid. When I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them from their enemies' lands and through them have vindicated my holiness in the sights of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord their God because I set them into exile among the nations and they assembled them onto their own land. I will leave none of them remaining against among the nations anymore. And I will not hide my face any more from them when I pour out my spirit upon the house of Israel, declares the Lord God. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Allie. The text of scripture that was just read to you is actually the beginning of the second half of the sermon from last week. (laughs) Last week, I, uh, when I spoke, I got to about about halfway through the sermon and said to myself, I think I have too much notes to continue the rest of the sermon. And so on uh, Sunday night, I told myself I'll preach the second half this week. And the sermon that I was going to preach like three weeks ago this Sunday, today, I'll put it in my back pocket and save it for another day. So if you see the theme that came out as being one of God hiding himself, that's why. In around the year, I don't have the year quite right because I couldn't find it in my book where I read this about 30 years ago. Around 18, or sorry, 805 AD, there was a man in Europe, a pastor, who believed that God hid himself, that God, in his sovereignty, in his free choice, had the right to hide himself from mankind. It was so controversial that this man believed that God was not obligated to reveal himself to all individual human beings that the man was executed for it by uh, the Vatican because he believed that God was sovereign in his choice of who he reveals himself to. This whole concept of God hiding himself is incredibly applicable in so many situations. It is such an excellent doctrine for us to rightly present God as he actually is. So let me give you just one example. I was watching a video of a Muslim guy who was questioning a man, a pastor, on the street, and he thought he had him. He asked this question, where does, in the New Testament, where does Jesus himself say that he is God, that he is divine in those exact words? words. And the pastor gave a decent reply, but I contemplated the thought myself, and I said, if if I was put in that situation, how would I respond? 
And brothers and sisters, the way I would respond is by going to Isaiah, our text from last week and our text from this week, Isaiah 45, verse 15, which says, You are, O Lord, a God who hides himself. And so rather than trying to answer this man's question, I would answer with a question. I would say to him, why does God sometimes hide himself? Now, the whole concept of God hiding himself is completely foreign to all the other religions in the world other than Christianity. It's unique to Christianity. And so, in attempting to answer that, he would be put in a dilemma. Because the moment he begins thinking about answering that question, he would have to admit that he does not believe God hides himself. And the reason he doesn't believe God hides himself is because he thinks, like many people do, that God is up in heaven, wringing his hands, hoping and praying that someone comes to know him, someone chooses him, so that God becomes subject to our choice. We don't like to think about God actually being the one who has the free will to either hide himself or reveal himself. And the moment the Muslim fellow would be put in that position, he would have to admit that he doesn't know the God of the Bible, that he cannot understand that Jesus in the New Testament reveals himself not uh, openly as God, but by implication over and over again. There is actually a theme in the New Testament where Jesus hides himself, and we'll look at that in a few minutes. So why is this doctrine of God hiding himself so controversial? Well, the answer comes partly in the text that was read a moment ago from Ezekiel chapter 39. What I want to do in this passage for you to begin with is to show you that indeed God hides himself and he hid himself from Israel. So you'll notice that at the end of the first, there's two paragraphs there, at the end of the first paragraph, because of Israel's sin, the Bible says, so I, God speaking, so I hid my face from them and handed them over to their enemies and they all fell by the sword. I dealt with them according to their uncleanness and their offenses and I hid my face from them. What I'm trying to do is establish in your mind the fact, the undebatable fact, that there are times when God hides himself from mankind. If you remember who he's hiding himself from, in this passage you'll realize that he's hiding himself from the nation of Israel. So if you start to do the math, you realize that at the time, Israel had a population of somewhere around three to four million people. The world had a population of around four to five hundred million. So if you realize that God hid his face from the nation of Israel and automatically was hiding his face from the rest of the world, you realize that far less than 1% of the world had an opportunity to know who God was. That when God hides his face from his own people, it therefore means that the vast majority of the world are in a position of not being able to see God. Do you remember the passage in uh, where Elijah says that he believed that he was the only prophet left who served God. And God reminded him that he had kept 7,000 who had not bowed their knee to Baal. What does that mean percent-wise? 
So if Israel was probably around 4 million people at the time, 3.5, 4 million people at the time, and only 7,000 people in Israel, out of all those people, knew the Lord, it means that he was hiding his face from the vast majority of the nation. And when you look at this first passage here closely, you'll see that there is a reason why God is hiding his face from Israel at this time. So this passage was given just after the Babylonians had conquered the city of Jerusalem and carried off the vast majority of the nation, well, that was left, that was still alive, off into captivity. So this passage here tells you that though the nation of Israel, well, to be honest, only 1% survived this judgment. When the Babylonians attacked Israel as a nation, only 1% survived that attack. Jeremiah, in chapter, I think it's chapter 52, tells us that 4,600 people were left. Which means that because of Israel's sin, God hid his face from them, and when he hides his face from them, Israel is subject to the nations. They no longer have his blessing. They no longer have his protection. And when that's taken away, as we saw last week, there is no hope for the people of God. And so Israel was subject to that judgment. Now, if you look at the second cha uh, chapter, not chapter, verse, um, in verse 25, you'll see that the Lord then decides to heal the nation of Israel. It says, therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says, I will now bring Jacob back from captivity and have compassion on all the people of Israel, that is all the ones who are left, and I will be zealous for my holy name. So what you'll see, what you see in this passage is that God comes to the he comes to heal Israel and in verse 29 he says I will no longer hide my face from them for I will pour out my spirit on the house of Israel declares the Lord so you see this concept of God hiding his face and when they're blessed what happens is God is no longer hiding his face from them and if you look through that chapter you'll see that there are two reasons why God stops hiding his face for, from the nation. In verse 25, it says that God will be, and I'm quoting it here, I will be zealous for my holy name. That is, that God shows his face to the nation of Israel and overlooks their sin and blesses them for his own sake not because they had done anything to deserve God's blessing upon them. Not that they had cleaned up their ways and therefore God says, I will show him them my face. No, God is saying that he has purposes that he wants to accomplish in the world and he's going to do it through his people. So for his own sake, he forgives their sin, he overlooks their sin and he blesses them, he shines his face upon them. The second factor in God showing his face to them is found in verse 29, where it says, I will no longer hide my face from them, for I will pour out my spirit on the house of Israel. Meaning this, that Israel becomes to, comes to be blessed by God, not because of their own strength, because they are strong enough to earn this blessing. It's not that at all. Rather, the text clearly says that it is because of the Spirit of God who comes to live in the Israelites that they are then enabled to live in such a way that God blesses them. Do you remember the story of when David slays Goliath? We so often say it's David slaying Goliath. Way to go, David. But the chapter before that is the one where Samuel anoints David 
with oil and the spirit of God comes on David. In other words, it wasn't David who slayed Goliath. It was the spirit of God in David that slayed Goliath. So the glory goes not to David, not to Israel as a nation when they're blessed. The glory goes to God who is working out his purposes in his people and he's working them out in his people by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in his people. Therefore, we don't get any glory. <laughs> we don't get any glory. We are those whom uh, the people of God are the ones who, whom God is using for his own purposes. We are the people whom God has simply blessed. So why the controversy over this concept that God hides himself well, let me first say this, brothers and sisters, something you need to be aware of. The only religion in the world that believes that God hides himself, that God can choose to not let his face shine on human beings, the only one that believes that is biblical Christianity. The Bible talks about it all over the place. If you know what you're looking for, you'll see that concept all over the Bible, especially in the New Testament and the Gospels. The Gospels are full of this concept of God hiding himself, and we're going to see that. But what I want to say to you is this, is that when you're sharing your faith with someone else or you're praying for someone else, you need to remember that God hides himself, that you might share the gospel with someone and their religious background doesn't allow them to understand what you're saying until they understand that God is in charge. And that's a big leap for some people to understand that God is not obligated to reveal himself to us is a huge leap. So where did this concept start? Okay, this concept starts in the Garden of Eden when God removes Adam and Eve from the garden and puts a barrier there, we should understand that that barrier is what I'm talking about. The place where they could go to meet with God, to fellowship with God, to... Uh, talk back and forth with God was cut off. And when it was cut off, mankind had no access to the face of God. And God's judgment was right and correct on mankind. And so what happens in the rest of the Bible? We begin to realize as the Bible unfolds, it's called progressive revelation. As the Bible continues to unfold, we understand that the only way that that, that being able to see the face of God can be reversed is not if mankind does the reversing, but rather that God does the reversing. Adam and Eve in the garden ran and hid from God. And mankind constantly hides from God. They prefer something other than the biblical God. A human being naturally does not pursue God. In fact, Fallen man thinks that he's God and therefore God is in some sense his servant and is obligated to do what he wants. That's why the serpent tricked them. They said, you'll, he said, you'll be like God. That is what he really should say is you'll foolishly think that you're God. You will be deceived into thinking you're God and it's a trap 
from which you cannot set yourself free. The only one who could possibly set mankind free is God himself. One of my favorite passages of scripture, after I began thinking about it for a while, is found in Isaiah chapter 46, verses 1 to 4. Let me read it for you. There's two sections to it. Bel, which is one of the Babylonian gods, Bel bows down. Nebo, he's another god, stoops low. Their idols are borne by beasts of burden. The images that are carried about are burdensome, a burden for the weary. They stoop down to, and bow down together, unable to rescue the burden. They themselves go off into captivity. That's the first two verses. The first two verses say that the false gods of the nations have to be carried by the people. That the false gods of the nation, when that nation gets conquered, the the people actually lay down their life for the preservation of the idol of their God. That they have to carry their God from one area to the next. And if their city gets overrun, they, they put their idol God on a cart and they get some horses and they try and drag it off to rescue their God. And it's a burden to fallen man. But the second two verses talk about biblical faith. God says, listen to me, O house of Jacob, all you who remain of the house of Israel, you whom I have upheld since you were conceived and have carried since your birth, even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he, I will, am he who will sustain you. I have made you and will carry you I will sustain you and I will rescue you. You see, brothers and sisters, the difference between biblical faith in God is not that we carry our God or we're the ones who are responsible. It's the other way around. He carries us. He is the one who reveals himself to us. If you have come to know him, understand that you haven't come to know him because you were smart enough to figure it out, that you cleared the veil, that you made the way for you to know God. That is not what the Bible says. The Bible says that the veil was open from the other side. And that's why Isaiah in chapter 53 says what it does when it says, surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered, it, considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquity. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Do you see what biblical Christianity is? It is not that we have somehow opened our eyes to see God. It's not that we carry God. It's not that our burdens are something that we carry on God's behalf so that our faith might be sustained. That's not what Christianity says. It says the other way. He is hidden from the vast majority of people, but in the life of a Christian, what have we come to understand? That God no longer hides himself from us, that we have come to see him, and that once we come to see him, we see that it's him who carries us. Our burden gets laid on the back of our Savior. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's, it's, it is literally the opposite of the religions of the world. That God carries us and no longer hides 
his face from us. It is profound. And it changes everything that we, the world thinks about God. When a person comes to know Christ, it, it is as though God takes their brain out and washes it with bleach and then puts it back in and says, now start thinking correctly. I'm God and you're not. <laughs> it's the beginning of the Christian life. The central reason why that man was ex executed in the mid-800s was that he believed that God is not obligated to reveal himself to all of mankind. He's not up, up in heaven wringing his hands, hoping that somebody comes to see him. And you pray like that, don't you? When you pray, do you pray like this? Dear God, open the eyes of my brother, my sister, my mom and dad, my friend, my co-worker. Do you, don't you pray that? Don't you say, God, open the eyes of, open their heart, make it sensitive to your word. What are you, you're praying biblically. You're saying mankind cannot do this for themselves. God has to step in and allow himself to be seen by that individual. And in case we think Jesus didn't think like this, I'm turning to Matthew chapter 13. Jesus tells a parable from verses 1 to 9. And all on its own, it's, fair, it's a little bit confusing, the parable. You're trying to put it in context. And even the disciples are like, what is that about? Verse 10, the disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? Verse 11, he replied, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Those seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They're, they hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they, because they hear. What Jesus is saying in that passage is exactly what the concept of God hiding his face is all about. Jesus is saying that he tells a parable and that there are people who don't get the parable. They don't understand where it's going. And the disciples are frustrated and Jesus says, yes, that's exactly what I planned to do. That there are people for whom the words of scripture, the words of our Lord himself hit their eardrum and make it vibrate. They hear the words, but God has not allowed them to understand what the words are talking about. That is God hides himself from them. It's been given to you, but not to them. So let us understand that when Jesus was on the earth, he openly said that he hides himself from some people. The miracles that Jesus does, for example, opening the eyes of a man born blind. You find it in John chapter 9. It's a fascinating story. If you read it through, it's actually quite humorous, intentionally humorous if you read it in context. But what you'll notice is, is that the man born blind has his eyes open so that he sees who Jesus is, but the scribes and the Pharisees don't. Jesus remains hidden from them. 
I want to show you this. In Luke, I, I felt this passage was so important that one evening I was waiting for Bible study, I memorized it. Listen to what Jesus says. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and have revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. Then listen to this. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So to summarize that, Jesus is saying that the Father is hidden from all people and only he truly sees the Father. But who comes to know the Father? Those whom the Son chooses to reveal him. God is not up in heaven wringing his hands, hoping that someone will come to him. In John 6, Jesus says in verse 37, all that my father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. So why does someone come to Jesus? Well, Jesus says it's because the father gave them to him. You say, well, the Father does that for everyone. No, in verse 44, uh, so they start grumbling about this. Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. No one can come to me except the Father who sent me draws him. And then down a little bit further, it says, Jesus says, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they have life. If you look at this passage then a little bit further, it says, Jesus went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the father who sent me has enabled him. Meaning this, that the New Testament, our Lord himself, I could, I could have chosen a hundred passages that talk like this in the New Testament. Jesus himself clearly tells us that, the, that God remains hidden from mankind unless the Father steps in, unless the Spirit steps in, unless the Son steps in. They re, God remains hidden from a human being. And so what shall we say? We've gathered here this morning to worship our God, to sing his praises, to acknowledge him. You read the Bible this morning and it makes sense to you, doesn't it? Not perfect sense because we don't completely have perfect knowledge, but you can understand its basic message. You can understand that Christ Jesus died as the savior of mankind. You understand these things. What I'm saying is, is the reason you understand them is because God has chosen not to hide himself from you that God has chosen to open your eyes, to open your ears, that you are here this morning worshiping the Lord our God by divine appointment so that none of the glory goes to us, none of the glory goes to you, none of it goes to, to me. <laughs> oh my goodness, the night the Lord saved me, I was, I was as dark as could be imagined. I knew nothing about God, nothing. And he stepped in and allowed me to see him. And I suggest the same is true of all of God's people. So brothers and sisters, as we worship the Lord our God here this morning, let us remember that we see Christ because of an act that God did on our behalf. And if others around you do not see what you see, 
that doesn't mean that what you see isn't accurate. Don't let that make your faith struggle. If you try to share your faith with someone or try to explain that the New Testament says that Jesus is the Son of God again and again and again and again, and you show it to someone and they say, I don't see it, don't say that to yourself, well, then maybe it's not true. Instead, say to yourself, dear Lord, I thank you that you've opened my eyes, that you've opened my heart to who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Amen. Let us pray. God, our Father, we thank you that you have allowed us to see your word, that the scriptures do indeed reveal the fact that Jesus is God and that hundreds of times in the New Testament, in the, in the gospels, this is made clear, but Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that we see it not because of our own wisdom, but because of your sovereign choice, you've chosen not to hide your face from us. And so we pray, Heavenly Father, that that veil would continually be removed from us, that the, the knowledge of who Jesus is as Savior and how trustworthy he is would only grow in us over the years. Heavenly Father, allow us to expose ourselves to the scriptures where Jesus is revealed to us May the Holy Spirit continually open our eyes to our Savior and the love of our Father. Give us this grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.